how's it going everyone, I'm the Canadian lad and after watching Iron Man 1 maybe a thousand times, this time I finally watched it in 0.25x speed and found a bunch of new details that you may have missed while watching in regular speed. So without wasting your time, I'll jump right to the point. Number 1. When Tony Stark shows Obadiah his arc reactor for the first time, there in the background we see a tank of palladium hexafluoride. Palladium is what mainly powers Tony's suits. Even when he was captured in the cave, he had to pull palladium from a missile to build his first ever Iron Man suit. That's palladium, 0.15 grams. Need at least 1.6. And we see an entire tank of palladium hexafluoride back in his compound where the arc reactor project was being worked on. Palladium hexafluoride may not yet exist in the real world, but palladium as a separate element is used to power a host of things including cars and buses in the real world. Number 2. When Tony flies for the first time in his Mark II suit just before taking off, he hits the wall of the garage, but his heads up display already warned him with a red indicator even before hitting the wall. This happens so quickly in the film that without slowing down the speed, it almost becomes impossible to notice such attention to detail. Here's how it looks in regular speed. Number 3. Ramin Javadi, who composed all the music in this movie, also worked as a composer for Game of Thrones. But what is so special about that, you may ask? And the answer to that is, Ramin actually reused his music notes from Iron Man to create the main theme of Game of Thrones. Listen to this couple of seconds from the Mark II soundtrack. And now listen to the main soundtrack of Game of Thrones. Because of copyright, I can't play the entire music, but you get the gist of it. Being a fan of both Game of Thrones and the MCU, it just feels good to know they're at least connected in one way. Number 4. When Tony Stark sees the Ten Rings torturing people on television news, it gives him an idea to not only use his suit for flying purposes, but to use it to fight the Ten Rings. As a test, he blasted at the ceiling to see how it's gonna work. But if I slow down the speed and zoom in, you can clearly see the energy moving from the arc reactor in his chest to his repulsor. This one is indeed an awesome attention to detail. Number 5. At the beginning of the film, when Tony Stark receives an award, the newspaper article actually foreshadows how Tony will eventually end up creating Ultron. It says, going off a radically simple theorem that artificial intelligence can be envived with personality through alternate programming is currently putting the finishing touches on two robotic prototypes that he believes will listen to him and learn from his behavior. Of course, this also applies to Jarvis, but Jarvis wasn't as advanced as Ultron and Tony didn't want to pull any punches in terms of outdoing himself. And this article actually proves that. Number 6. Obadiah tells Tony that the Ark Reactor is his ninth symphony. This is your ninth symphony. In the classical music world, there's a belief that after a composer writes their ninth symphony, they would die. He was implying that the arc reactor would be the last thing Tony created before Obadiah kills him. And if I stretch this a bit more, then you will notice that Tony Stark died on his 10th film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So after appearing in the MCU for 9 times, he dies on the next one which is Avengers Endgame. In that regard, Avengers Infinity War was Tony Stark's ninth symphony, where he managed to bleed Thanos when no one else could. Number 7. When Tony sent Pepper to retrieve all recent shipping manifests, Pepper found all the details on shipments that took place without the approval of Tony Stark. One of those files has a vessel that is called MSC Lebowski. And if we go furthermore, we see the word Credence Tapes on the file as well. This is a huge reference to Jeff Bridges' The Big Lebowski. Uh, tape deck, some Credence Tapes, and there was a... Uh... Another reference to the Big Lebowski is the barcode on a different shipping manifest. It has the dude written on it, which is a direct reference to this scene. I'm the dude. So that's what you call me, you know? Uh... Number 8. After Tony Stark saves a couple of refugees of Gulmira, he comes back with the damaged suit because the US military was trying to take him down. Pepper then catches Tony for the first time in his Iron Man suit. But notice in the background, we can see the prototype of Captain America's shield that Howard Stark had built. We later see this again in Iron Man 2, but more about that in a future video. Number 9. This movie shows Tony Stark's voice recognition system in a very detailed manner. In the scene where Tony speaks to Jarvis, Regarding the icing problem in his suit, you can see in the background screen where Jarvis is able to read everything Tony's been saying. But notice when the lady in the television starts speaking, Jarvis no longer reads that, indicating that Jarvis has the ability to recognize different types of voices. Now we all know Jarvis is programmed to recognize different types of voices, but to be able to see it visually in the movie deserves an applaud. Number 10. In the final fight between Iron Monger and Iron Man, Tony takes off the suit's hand, resulting in a delay between his actual voice and the audio coming out of his suit, Mark III's internal mic system. 
This only happens when his helmet is closed, but there's another hole in the suit. It causes a delay because the suit cannot contain his actual voice when there's another hole in it. I'll play it in slow motion and you'll be able to hear the delay. <laughs> Number 11. Now this has nothing to do with watching this movie in slow motion, but I'd still like to mention this one thing about Tony Stark. Remember the scene when Tony said yes for an appointment with Agent Coulson? Tell you what, you got it. You're absolutely right. I'm gonna go to my assistant and we'll make a date. You can see Tony wasn't paying attention. He was surprised to see Pepper in that dress and got totally oblivious of everything else. So he didn't really mean it when he said he will talk to Pepper to set that meeting. He just wanted to get rid of Agent Coulson so he could talk to Pepper. But later in the film, we see Agent Coulson waiting at the Stark Industries for his appointment, even though Tony Stark totally forgot about it. Pots, we had an appointment. Did you forget about our appointment? Nope, right now. Come with me. And that's how Agent Coulson with other S.H.I.E.L.D. agents were able to rescue Pepper, otherwise Obadiah might have already killed her. So Tony's false promise worked in favor of saving Pepper. Now let's fast forward to Iron Man 3. In the beginning of that movie, Tony Stark again makes a false promise, this time with Eldritch Killian. Tony said he will see him up in the roof, but Tony never showed up. Killian took it as an insult, and even Tony acknowledged that he had created a demon at that very moment. I had just created demons, and I didn't even know it. So why am I telling you this? To show you that even though Tony's aptitude for making false promises to Agent Coulson may have saved Pepper, but the same kind of behavior actually puts him and Pepper both in danger in Iron Man 3. And that's how Tony learned from his mistake and was hesitant to join Captain America for the time heist in Avengers Endgame. Because now he thinks before giving his words. He worries about his family before anything else. And I think that's some great character development for Tony Stark. Anyway, so that's all I have right now from Iron Man 1 and I hope I was able to give you at least one new information through this video and if i did then don't forget to grab the subscribe button and give me a thumbs up i really appreciate all your support and i promise to bring quality content at least twice every week i'll see you lads in the next one okay.